serve an impartial God. Matthew 5.45 tells us he causes his son to rise on the just and the unjust. He sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. Last night at Big Word, we talked about 2 Kings chapters 4 to 8. In that, we saw the prophet Elisha performing various miracles for different people. And the the striking thing about this is that it didn't matter the status or the position or the wealth or, or the reputation of any of these people. He gave them what they needed in the moment they needed it. Now, some of them had to come to him and ask for it. Some of them came to him offering him assistance, and then he returned and gave them gifts at, uh, as a form of gratitude for what they had done. Some of them expected... They had different expectations, but whatever it was that they needed, whether it was food, if it was purity, if it was restoration, if it was um, a child, all of these things, life, he gave, granted these things to them, regardless of who they were, of what they could offer him in return. His, um, his extension of God's love was boundless. It was not qualified by, uh, well, according to scripture, it doesn't seem to be qualified by anything. This reminds us of Matthew 25, where Jesus, he's talking about the kingdom of God and, and who will be granted, uh, who will be um, welcome into the, the Father's home. And what is it? Matthew 25, verses 34 through 40. And he talks about, uh, the Father's going to say, you know, you you fed me and you clothed me and, and you gave me comfort and you visited me while I was in prison and you did all of these things. And the righteous man will say, when did I do these things? I don't remember doing these things. And and you, you'll you re remember this phrase. You'll recall this. Whatever you did for the least of these, these brothers of mine, you did for me. Now, what that is suggesting is that we can serve God without being blatant about serving him. When we serve others and when we love others the way that he has loved us, that is serving our God. We have no idea. We could be surrounded by angels in disguise and be uh, entertaining uh, servants of our king unaware. And uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So let's get back into Second Kings. So this week with Big Word, we talked about a number of different things, but we started off with all of these different miracles of provision. After that, we led into the story of Naaman. And I do love the story of Naaman because he he has a very um, distinct point that his servant makes. Naaman, of course, is he's uh, very wealthy. He's, he's a commander of the army. He's a respected and revered man within the nation of Syria. I mean, he even eats at the palace with the king. And, and so he gets leprosy. Now, we don't know exactly what the rules were for neighboring nations regarding skin diseases. We know what they were for Israel because we have Deuteronomy, we have Leviticus, we know what those laws were and that it was uh, it was taken very, very seriously. Now, in Syria, we don't know exactly. However, we know that he was of a position high enough that the king would send out letters of uh, recommendation to these other nations seeking anyone who could heal his commander. So when the letters went out, they went out, eventually, um, the, this young Jewish servant girl who was living in Naaman's home said, listen, I know a prophet. I know you're sending out all these letters, but I know of someone who can actually heal you. He is, you know, a prophet of the almighty God of Israel. So Naaman packs up his bags with all of his gold and his silver and all of these things, and he heads out to Elisha's home. Elisha doesn't come out to greet him. Again, we know what the Jewish laws were. He's not allowed to speak with someone who has leprosy. He needs to keep his distance because it was a highly communicable disease. So he stayed inside. Um, don't again. I don't know all of the all of the uh, details of his his motivation. What I know is what we have in scripture, and I can speculate here and there. But for the most part, we know he didn't go out. Naaman was highly offended by this. Finally, Elisha sends out. Uh, one of his servants gives him instructions, go over to the river, dip seven times, you'll be fine. Naaman is indignant. He's so upset. I came all this way. He needed to wave his hand over me. He needed to come out with these words and basically put on a big show. He wanted a show to know that his healing was going to happen and that it was real and that this guy actually was a servant of a powerful God. So in verse 15, this is 2 Kings 
uh, chapter 5, verse 13, his servant comes to him and says to him, you know, Father, if the prophet had asked you to do something difficult, if he had asked you to do something hard and heroic, wouldn't you have done it? So why are you hesitating to do this very, very simple thing? If he asked you to do something huge and complicated and glorious, you wouldn't have hesitated. But since he's asking you to go wash in a dirty river, you're all, oh, well, I can't do that. This is, this is, you know, nothing. So he doesn't do it. So, but after his servant confronts him on this, on his pride and lack of humility, Naaman does. And he goes and he washes and he's healed. He then, you know, offers a proclamation of faith. And, and he says, um, you know, your God is truly the only God. Uh, what is it he says? Hold on, let me see. In verse uh, 15 again, he says, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no God anywhere on earth other than the God of Israel. And then in gratitude, let me give you this gift. So he tries to give him a gift. You can read the details there. You can go online uh, to get the study guide and, and dive into this God's big word a little bit deeper. But right now I want to focus on the easy task. Over the summer, I had a friend come out and visit um, from Oklahoma. She's a writer friend of mine, and she came out to visit. We met for coffee, and, and she had other things she needed to do, so I ended up just walking around the city. I, I love Manhattan. I love walking around the city. There's just something uh, really romantic and, and just exhilarating about being in the city. And I don't get in very often, so um, I'm home with my kids and doing other things, but I was in the city that day, so I decided to just walk around. And as I'm walking around Bryant Park, I'm I'm looking, all these people are sitting and they're drinking their coffee and reading their books and, and talking and all of these things. And I'm praying and I ask God, can you show me one person before I leave the city today? I wanna to share the gospel with just one person. And so show me who it is. And as I'm looking around, I just got this, niggling whisper, you know, in the back of my mind, just pick one. Just, just pick one? Yeah, just pick one, you know. And so it, clearly I'm not hearing an audible voice from God, but it was just the spirit stirring in me saying, it doesn't matter who it is, just pick one. Well, in my mind, I'm thinking, no, I need, you know, flashes of light and I need to know, okay, God, you know, tell me which person here is having a really bad day and really needs to know and, and, and who has been watered and, and prepared for this moment so that they can accept Christ the moment I share it with them. And there was no lightning. There was no flash of sunbeam. There was no uh, glorious revelation of who needed to know a word from God from me that day. And so you know what I did? Nothing. I, I spent probably three hours in the city that day and did not share God's love with anyone. I walked around, I had a great day, but I didn't do anything. I was waiting for something big so that I would know I had some specific purpose and I didn't do it. This is what's going on with Naaman here and I wanna challenge you as you think about these things. If you're waiting for some big thing for God to give you, some big task or some big job, if we were told to go you know, do something big, I don't know that many of us would hesitate because we know the big things produce big results. But we often neglect these little things. If we're given some task and it's just a little thing, invite your neighbor to dinner. You know, say hi to that mom who's always lonely at pickup. You know, uh, share a meal with some neighbor kid that looks like he's hungry. You know, whatever it might be. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is. No small matter, let me back up. No obedience is considered small. It doesn't matter what it is that we're doing. If we are doing it in obedience to God and to his spirit, it's a big deal. So... I, I just want to encourage you, you know, don't skip over the easy tasks because you think they're too small or insignificant. Every act of obedience is significant. Another story that that hit me strongly um, through this passage was, uh, hold on, let me get this back on, was in 2 Kings chapter 6. Um, I want to read this to you. 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 15. Now, let me back up a minute. Elisha and his servant, you know, th there was a war going on and all of these, there was battle, okay? So in verse 15 of chapter 6, it says the prophet's attendant, this is Elisha's attendant, the prophet's attendant got up early in the morning when he went outside, there was an army surrounding the city along with horses and chariots. He said to Elisha, oh no, my master, what will we do? Elisha replied, 
Don't be afraid, for our side outnumbers them. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he can see. The Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw that the hill was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There are many times that we feel like we're all alone in this pursuit of God, that we are all alone in our, um, I, I don't want to say conservative purity, because that's not the image I want to cast out, but we're all alone in this distinct lifestyle of following God and, and earnestly seeking His will as our first priority. Um, it, it is lonely, and we are few, but we are not alone. We are not the only ones. And He can encamp His angels all around us. Um, those who are supporting us and encouraging us and feeding us, we can't always see them, but they're there. Yesterday I blogged on my post about how I accidentally started a human rights organization. Um, you'll want to go check it out and, and get the full story on this, but this passage right here in 2 Kings chapter 6 was something that became very visible. It was it was a very tangible story to me and a friend this summer. We, um, we got together to pray. We grew aware of the issue of human trafficking and the realities of it and this this colossal horrific situation that um, that peppers this globe and we got together not knowing what to do we just decided to pray and we prayed and it was just the two of us and we sat there uh, not distraught or discouraged but just bewildered it's just the two of us we're two moms getting together to pray in the middle of the suburbs and what can we possibly do to stop slavery around the world? What can we possibly do to make a dent in human trafficking? And we prayed and we cried and we prayed some more. And, um, and as time went on, the days passed after that, God opened our eyes to see the entire army of people surrounding us who all wanted to join this battle but needed needed someone to lead them, to show them where to go and what to do. And and so that was in July. Um, within two weeks, we had a group of 15 people who wanted to meet on a regular basis. Within about a month, we had over 40 people on our mailing list. And we have our first major event tomorrow, actually. So um, yeah, visit the website if you want to come. We're doing a, a viewing and, and awareness event where you can figure out how you can get involved in human trafficking. But um, that's that's kind of a side issue. My, my point is, we thought it was just the two of us. We thought we were the only ones. And how in the world are we going to be armed to fight this battle we don't even know where to start, but God opened our eyes and he re revealed to us that we're not alone. And if we are pursuing his heart, his heart for whatever it is that we feel called to do, you know, in this instance, we feel called to, to, uh, help the oppressed and, and to promote justice for, um, for those who are being held in slavery. So for us, that's what the specific heart of God is that he has placed on us and, and in that, we're not alone. There are people all around us, people next door, quite literally next door, who want to join this fight, who care about it, but don't know they need some direction. And God has given us that direction. And together as a group, we're able to move forward with that. That's what happened to Elisha and his prophet. And, and Elisha, um, praise God, was able to see this. And then when he prayed that God would open the eyes of his servant, his servant was able to see this. And they did outnumber their enemies. Uh, what is what is that saying that um, one with God is always the majority? And that's what we are. When we are pursuing God's will and God's heart, we are in the majority. So um, so those are the big admonitions I have for you this week. I, I pray that you are encouraged. If you um, have not yet been to the website, go check it out. I've got the new homework up for the next session section we'll be meeting again in two weeks to talk about second kings i believe it's chapters 9 through 13 so go to tanydennisbooks.com there you can download study guides for our next ses session as well as past sessions and you can um, see what other resources we have available there so thanks for joining us if you have any prayer requests please don't hesitate to contact me we do have a number of prayer requests within our group for health for restoration for marriages for um exciting adventures that uh that some of us are going to be going on very shortly. So I pray, um, or I ask you to lift up one another in prayer. 
And uh, yeah, until next time. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye.